as uh, we learned before, there are many different levels of autonomy. Uh, I am not uh, an expert, quite the opposite to what we've just heard. I am an ex-seafarer. So my questions about the risks involved are somewhat different maybe to the, to the last speech that we heard. This one will centre mostly around the uh, remote control vessels as well as fully autonomous uh, artificial intelligence or, or AI vessels. As we've heard already, uh, this isn't really much of a look into the future, uh, very similar to the last uh, presentation. There are already moves afoot and technology is moving quite quickly, more quickly than maybe uh, the clubs and the, and the service providers are actually uh, ready for. To think about autonomous and road control vessels, we have to have a look at, quick look at what we already do. So the P&I clubs do quite a lot, but the, the main headlines of what we do are up there now. So we, we are insurance providers for ship owners' liabilities to third parties. So we won't be insuring the, the hull uh, or the machinery uh, per se, but the uh, liabilities to third parties. So cargo liabilities, such as uh, costs incurred through damage or cargo uh, shortages. Cargo is something that came up at the end of the last panel. Crew claims, injury, illness, costs incurred through treatment and legal costs. Fixed and floating objects, or FFO as we call it, I'm sure we've all seen on YouTube, uh, container ships and ferries careering into uh, gantries and knocking them over like Domino Rally. Well, that's something that we would uh, cover the cost of. Can be very costly. Uh, interesting to listen to the auto docking system and the potential costs involved around an accident with technology of that level. Collision liability is not covered by the hull and machinery. So not the hardware, but maybe crew injury again, pollution, cargo losses. Pollution cleanup, big one. Uh, the people that you see polishing seals and birds and uh, cleaning up oil uh, off the uh, sea. And wreck removal uh, is also usually a very costly claim for us, uh, having to get rid of a total loss vessel. And there are contributions to salvage on top of the hull and machinery uh, that we cover if it's not covered for the ship owner. Quite a large proportion of our claims are people related. Now that is actual claims, injury and illness, and it is also, as we've heard before, this term human error. It's not a term that, that is great anymore or widely used uh, and is a presentation in itself as to whether that is an actual root cause, but needless to say, people are involved. So we would hope to see maybe a few less of those, leaving us with the cargo, the ship and the pollution aspect of things. How we handle these uh, legally with the claims handlers um, and in loss prevention, the likes of myself and Costas at the end there, uh, is based around history. And that's very similar to the first slide that we saw today, where experts are bored through historical matters, not really looking into the future. So we rely on a mature legislative framework with clear definitions and confidence in how these will be applied. Put briefly, things like case law. It's happened before, and this is what was laid down. The marker and the benchmark has been set. Uh, phrase I use almost daily, and I'm sure other loss prevention uh, ex-skippers uh, like Costas do the same, best practice. Okay, guidance, such as the code of safe work and practice for merchant seafarers, and of course the codes that we live by at sea the big hitters such as SOLAS and MARPOL, STCW and the collision regulations. Will these apply as they do now in the future? What we need to do, as with any job, when we're talking to seafarers or whether we're talking to legal bots, is we have a look at the risks involved. And one of the things we do is a risk assessment and it's as simple as that. You can call it a hazard, you can call it a hazard, you can call it whatever you like. But essentially, we need to know what the risks are, and then we need to put some barriers in place. So the barriers we currently have, our examples are uh, the P&I rules. Every club will have their rule book, and it will tell you what we will and will not cover, and how we go about determining whether we will or will not cover. A lot of these things reference things like the Hague-Visby rules, 
uh, seaworthiness, which includes having a competent and good crew on board at the commencement of the voyage. Not entirely sure we're ready for fully autonomous vessels or even remote control vessels, if that's the case. Current codes and conventions, like I said before, big hitters include MARPOL, SOLAS, STCW, collision regulations. The IMO is currently conducting a scoping exercise of some of these big hitting codes uh, with the hope of producing a gap analysis for the autonomous vessels. But as we know, with all due respect, that these things can take some time. And as we saw in the first slide, and as we've listened to multiple times already, this is already gathering quite a lot of pace. So how long will we have to wait till we know what the gaps are in those regulatory frameworks that we have in place? We know some of the current risks will be similar to normal vessels, if I can call them normal vessels. Admiralty claims, collisions, um, FFOs. People claims, are we going to get rid of them? Probably reduce them, certainly. Cargo claims, discussed very briefly at the end of the last panel, and I agree, it's sometimes the, the technology guys are so far ahead, it's guys like myself and Costas here who are asking the considered very small questions that are costing us quite a lot of time and money. Cargo, how are we going to load it properly? How are we going to monitor it on passage? Again, the Hague Visby rules carry with care. Emerging risks, some that we don't even know about. Some that are already there, but maybe the scale is currently quite small. We've heard a few times about cyber risks. And as I was said, in 2021, everybody will be expected to have something to do with uh, the management of cyber risks in their SMS. Cyber risks are, of course, a problem for normal vessels. But imagine the scale of cyber problems for fully autonomous vessels and even the remote control center ashore. And not only cyber security, but emerging risk of uh, the actual physical security now not only of the vessel in high-risk areas but also of the control center ashore. We don't want just any old Tom, Dick or Harry walking around our control center pushing buttons. So some of the things we're considering, and I haven't got the answers because as I said before, I am not an expert in autonomous technology. I am an ex -seafer. People claims we don't expect to go away the focus of them may shift a little bit, especially with fully autonomous vessels. But who and to what degree will still be affected? There will still be people involved in this, even third parties. And as I said before, that's one of our primary concerns. Pilots, local knowledge, stevedores, tug masters, tug skippers. We're considering the uh, Risk attitude, I, I quite like that term, but uh, as anybody that's worked at sea will tell you, if you're still on the bridge of a ship and the weather's quite bad, you don't have to get all the way to the limits before you do something about it. You do something early. Now, it's because you're stood there and you're feeling it and your risk attitude is slightly different to a guy who sat thousands of miles away considering where the limits are, or in the case of the other one there, no person at all. Competency and training is something that I'm involved with, with the Maritime UK Regulatory Working Group. There is currently no requirement to have seafarers involved at all. And in fact, some of the remote control vessels that have been used have only one seafarer and three non-seafaring control operators. I'm not saying this is wrong and I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that it is not being considered by things such as STCW as yet. There are moves afoot to try and get another chapter put into STCW to concern ourselves with the standard of uh, training. Sufficient independent experts, we all know from any accident that one of the main go-to things we do is we get some independent expert advice. Right, back to that first slide, that's all learned historically, not looking into the future. So where is our pool of independent experts now? Not just ex-seafarers, but lawyers as well. Remote station jurisdiction, UK flagged fully autonomous vessel operating in international waters with a control station in Denmark. Definition of good seamanship. Reference a lot in the call regs. Think of rule two for any UC seafarers out there, which clearly states the master and crew thereof. There's no thereof, they're not there. 
And uh, unsafe berth is, is one of the very quick claims that's thrown out there um, by ship owners. It was unsafe, and, and we often reference good seamanship. Could you get in and out of that uh, with just using good seamanship? Uh, collision apportionment, not many cases where everybody gets 100%. If there's a collision between a manned vessel and a fully autonomous vessel, who on the autonomous vessel is taking that liability? Is it the programmer? Is it the software developer? I, I don't know. Cyber security I've touched on already, and seaworthiness I've touched. Seaworthiness is something hugely important term in the P&I, uh, particularly when it comes to dealing with claims. Was it seaworthy, yes or no? The Hague-Visby rules are all the way through our rule book, and that relies currently relatively heavily on there being a competent crew on board. So what will we need to change what we're offering? Will we need to change rather than anything else? We already see different types of insurance coming out, war and things like that. Will we need a whole new one? Who's going to cover these new things? Whilst the identified areas I've put on are kind of broadly the same, admiralty, cargo, people, pollution, will uh, things like hull and machinery insurers start covering software? I don't know, I can't speak for them. Have we identified all the challenges and risks the answer to that is almost certainly no, from a, a P&I point of view. And once we've identified them, what are we going to do about them? What do we know about them? What is in place as a barrier for them? For those newly identified things, are we starting again with a slightly clean slate? Thank you.